presentation also in Boston for the joint mathematical meeting. Uh, how long were these presentations? Long, uh, short? 15, 15 minutes. In front of how many people, more or less? Uh, Oh, that's a lot. Of, that's a that's a big group. Not not a huge group, but a, but a pretty decent class group. How did you feel? Uh, I've had I've had a couple of presentations like um, at my school, so I guess the only difference is like I was in front of people that know what I was doing, so they were like kind of like expert also. So you have like you had to be very confident in what you're saying and know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go through that because uh, that's that's very true. Uh, I know people who throw up before they make presentations. Um, that's just how they deal with it. Who else raised their hand? Yes, so I'm, I'm actually a, a member of Toastmasters, Very which good. is, Very which good. is a public speaking organization. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I have to, I've had to give several speeches on many different topics in front of, it's usually in front of like about 15 people, so okay. the, it's not a very big audience. I just hit record. Yeah, I was just giving a, uh, Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. okay, I'm sorry. So, oh, yeah, so, so I mean, I was pretty anything much done. larger and outside of Toastmasters? Um, I can't think of anything else. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else with hands? I saw other hands. There you go. Well, I, uh, I work for a student services program on campus, and uh, we, we have a similar program to several campuses. So we have. Um, conferences where we get together and we present the model of our program. Okay. So that's present in front of maybe 30 people. Okay, good amount. Chat? Uh, yeah, I'm a part of Scythe Student um, and Free Enterprise. Okay. And we had to go to um, Charlotte this past semester and, pre and present on our projects that we were working on. It was in front of a panel and also on um, the other teams that were competing. So it's about 50 people. That's a lot of people. How did you feel? Nervous? Yeah. yeah but it was up. a group, so it was like we broke it up into different sections. So okay. we had each other to support. <laughs> okay. well, that's really good. Anybody else for the story? I was the uh, business president of the UCC. Mm -hmm. So we had a open house inviting new, new uh, members mm -hmm. to come in and talk about the uh, benefits of being part of the business club. Sounds like a big group. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a, like in the auditorium, so okay. it, was, it was well over about a hundred people. All right. So, so you're not a you're not a kid. Because we know each other. But uh, yeah. so you must have done this more than once before, or is it sort of the okay? All right. So uh, I used to hate making presentations. So here's here's something that I just kind of so. <clears throat> Old saying, you know, nothing is certain in life except death and taxes. Well, also, you will be asked to make a presentation at some point in your life, and you'll probably be asked to give many. Um, so, I guess I teach, so I give two or three a week. Um, but outside of that, you know, before I was in this, um, doing what I'm doing right now, um, I used to give speeches in front of uh, anywhere from 100 to maybe 700 people. Um, and it used to scare the crap out of me. Um, doesn't any longer, um, but it, everybody seems to have a similar experience. So here's something new, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of story about this. So U.S. business schools. So most of us are in U.S. business schools, not all of us. Who's not in a U.S. business school? Okay. So about, uh, about half. Um, so U.S. business schools go through presentations all the time. In fact, if you get to uh, a master's level, that's what, well, I wouldn't say that's all you may be doing. You'll do it often. Um, uh, it's just what U.S. business schools do. Uh, European business schools, they don't concentrate on it as much as they do other things, and that's neither good nor bad. It's just different. Um, so here's a story. So my background was I got out of grad school. I worked for a company called Standard & Poor's, and we rated bonds. Um, you probably uh, heard the name bantered about. It got a little bit of bad press over the last several years, deservedly so. Um, then I went to uh, Barclays Capital, and I was in charge of their U.S. Asset Backed Securitization Group. Uh, and then I went to Societe Generale, if you know Sakjen, a uh, very, very large French bank, one of the large, uh, 10 largest banks in the world. And they had an investment banking subsidiary on Wall Street, and I was co head of their U.S. Asset Backed effort. Well, they're French. And periodically, 
um, for training, they would take uh, executives, and I was senior at the time, um, and they would fly them to France. And they would go through two weeks of basically um, learning what they wanted us to learn. But much of that was presentation skills, because you know, at a senior level, if you're not doing presentations, well, you're not senior. They don't want anybody, anybody who can't make a presentation, because in the banking world, the investment banking world, the insurance world, it's sort of about bringing business into the firm. Um, and there's a premium on that. Uh, failing to do that, you still have a job, but the job is sort of capped because they really want people to bring money into the firm. So, I don't know, maybe there were 30 people in this in this uh, this conference, five Americans and five French, and everybody was from around the world. And we noticed something, and we talked to our friends that um, you know, the Europeans they didn't concentrate on giving presentations, and because of that, they needed more work to sort of catch up. The Americans did it all day long. Uh, we were pretty much more advanced. I don't think the Asians did it nearly as much as well. The other really neat thing to note, too, is that everybody came from around the world, and the presentations were in English, because it is the language of business. So you know, for two weeks, we practiced, uh, ate French food, which is really, really good thing to do. Um, and then uh, you know, we got to see Paris a little bit, which, if you've never seen, is an amazing city. So there are a lot of ways you can do presentations. So let's start with some of the easiest. Team meetings. So I ran a team of 15 people. I ran a team of five people periodically. And that was probably once a week, once every two weeks. We would get together. And being the, uh, the managing director, I needed to know what my folks were doing. So the people who were in charge of you know, whatever project we were doing would stand up and basically say, this is what I'm doing. Um, small group. 10 people, not a whole lot of stress because you know everybody in the room, right? Everybody's your, if it's not a friend, they're a colleague, but you know them. So it's a whole lot you know, different than talking in front of people that you don't know or who you know, may, um, you know, maybe they think that they're, you know, they, they know more than you do. But the presentations are really quick, you know, one to five minutes. You know, we don't want long meetings, but you know, stand up, tell me what you're doing, sit down, let this ne next person go. And relatively speaking, they're pretty easy. The only stress is that the boss is in the room. And of course, you want to do your best in front of your supervisor. So that's the sort of the stress part of it. Client meetings. Serious, serious stress. Um, but they're relatively small meetings. So it sort of works like this. So normally, you would take, uh, you know, as, as, a, as the head of the group, I may take three people with me and meet with a client <coughs> four on four or three on three, but a relatively small meeting. Um, but basically, there are two parties. There's your firm, and then there's your client. Um, you don't know the client, but you generally don't know him or, or them. Um, and normally, the way it works is that the senior person does almost all the speaking, but periodically, I would say to you know my associate or my vice president or somebody who's you know working below me um, on a pretty technical matter. Now it's your turn to stand up, and talk to your client, and make sure that you come off credible or come off interesting to help win the business. Um, that's the, the stressful part of it. Because if you screw up, uh, everybody sees it, and your boss sees it, and you don't get the deal, um, and it doesn't reflect well upon you. So it's high stress. So your boss is there, but at the end of the day, it's a great win if you do well, and, and it reflects badly um, if it doesn't come across that, uh, that well at all. So um, smaller meeting. All right, special occasions. Anybody ever had to make a a speech at a wedding? How'd you feel? It was okay. Yeah, nervous? I'm not sure. Very good. Most people are nervous. I had to do it twice. I was real nervous uh, before I kind of learned how to make a presentation. But I got in front of, I don't know, maybe 100 people, maybe 125. It was a relatively decent sized group. And I had to do a reading. And uh, shit. Uh, funerals are hard. I've never had to do that. Sometimes special occasions, people retire, people leave a job and go uh, someplace else, and somebody says something nice about that person, and then they stand up in front of the room. Um, these tend to be a little bit less stressful. Um, I don't know how you do this. Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard when you're, when you're upset and you have to you know, say something. I, I always admire people that can get up and kind of you know, work through that adversity uh, and, and talk, eulogize, basically. You know, um, weddings are a little bit easier, but still, you're talking about a lot of people, and that's not an easy thing to do. 
All right, and then we have conferences. This is where it really gets you. Um, so large groups of people, and everybody in this room, at some point in time, and probably many, many, many points in time, will be asked by their boss, I want you to go to this actuarial conference. Um, and by the way, there'll be 2,000 people there. Um, <laughs> and, and that's okay, but oftentimes there'll be, uh, in fact, all the time, there'll be presentations, because you don't go there necessarily just to meet and greet, but you go there to learn. Um, so you'll pick the, uh, you know, the topics that you want to listen to, and oftentimes there's a panel, three or four people, um, talking to maybe 40 or 50 people, but sometimes there's one person talking to 2,000, um, and that's where it gets kind of weird. Um, typically the people who do that are relatively senior, um, because uh, you need to kind of have sort of a high degree of expertise before you find yourself in front of a group that large, um, and it can be very stressful. go back here for a second. So first time I was asked to do this, so I was with Standard & Poor's and I was doing a type of a transaction that was at the time relatively novel. Um, it was very interesting but not a lot of people knew about it. So they said, Barry, I want you to make this presentation and I had never made a presentation before. So we're going to talk a little bit about you know what we did. Um, but it was, I'm thinking 300 people, maybe 400 people and they, and they taped it. So I'm thinking, you know, and, and I'm quaking in my boots, and, uh, and I'm really nervous, and I'm thinking, this just really sucks. I mean, I'm, I, I know I'm not doing a great job, until I saw it on tape. And it was, you know what, that wasn't really terrible. Uh, in fact, I don't think anybody in the audience really knew how nervous I was. Uh, and that's one of the things that sort of a takeaway on large presentations, is that you don't necessarily show your nerves. Um, uh, because when I, and I don't watch this tape anymore, and, um, but it was like, he's, he's relatively polished. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't such a terrible thing. Uh, it felt long, it felt like I was doing it for hours. It was probably about a 15 minute presentation, <laughs> but, it, but it was okay. So there are a couple of things that when you're thinking about doing a presentation, well, gee, what if I'm not very good? Well, nobody's really that good at first. Nobody's born to be a great presenter. Uh, so the art of making a presentation is a learned skill. In other words, the more you do it, the better you do. Um, so when I started it, I would say I was really good, and, and you get better over time. Practice does make perfect. So, you know, going back to that first presentation at Standard & Poor's, so what did I do? Well, I would practice out loud. So I would, you know, get myself in a room, and at the time I, I wrote my speech. Don't ever write your speech, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. But as a good way of starting it, you write your speech, so you have an idea of what you want to say. And the more you say it, the better it comes out when you finally deliver it. Sometimes I would say um, you know, to my wife, can I make the presentation in front of you? I just wanna, I want somebody else's feedback. Tell me what I'm doing wrong, tell me what I'm doing right. Both sides. Silently, a lot of times I'll just sit at my desk and I'll go through it, and I'll go through it, and I'll go through it. Um, it's not quite the same as saying it out loud, but it's better than not saying it. And then sometimes in the mirror too, because you can see if your posture is bad, and other things, but you can kind of see it. So there's a lot of things that you can do um, just to kind of reassure yourself that the presentation you're going to make is as professional as you can possibly make it. So what happens if I screw up? Well, don't. Don't screw up. So there's, you know, words to the wise. But basically, you're not going to screw up if you know your facts um, and you don't BS. So, and that's all, and that's all practice. So, you know, know it. Know what you want to say, and if you sort of venturing into some place that's a little bit unknown to you, don't go there. Uh, and here's a, here's a good one. Don't give away any privileged information. And this is both a good and a bad thing. So a lot of times you go to these conferences, and there's this amazing subject that you want to listen to, um, but they're not telling you anything that's cutting edge. Why? Because the person working for Barclays doesn't want the person at Goldman Sachs to say, aha, now I know what he's doing, and I'm going to do it too. So they'll give you some information, but they won't give you enough to be dangerous. Um, and just keep that in the back of your mind, too. Your boss will let you know that. All right, so what happens if I'm boring? Well, uh, don't be. Um, so we'll talk about ways to make your presentation a little bit more, if it's not exciting, but at least not boring. Um, there's always going to be somebody who's going to be not going to be interested. You're talking to hundreds of people, and some people just aren't interested in your subject. That's okay. Um, better than bo to be boring than to be bad. Um, but again, we'll talk about ways to to not be boring. 
All right, what if you are asked a question that you can't answer? All right, so there's, a, there's an expression. If you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, baffle them with your bullshit. Um, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> uh, every once in a while somebody does, and they'll, um, they'll, they'll think that they're a little bit too cute, and they'll sort of pretend that they know the answer. Um, but for the people in the audience who know as much as the presenter, uh, it doesn't come across well because they know that they're wrong. So if you don't know the answer, say, gee, I'm really not sure. I don't know the answer to that. I'd be happy to get back to you. I'd love to see you when the presentation is over. We can exchange contact information, and I'll research it for you. Um, but I've seen people you know, fudge their answer, and it just it, you lose all credibility. So seriously, if you don't know the answer, I don't know the answer. Good question. What if no one cares? Well, you shouldn't be in the audience, right? If you can just turn that to silent. Um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, some people go to conferences and they just kind of sit someplace because they think they may be interested in it. Um, you can't help that, don't worry about it. Not much you can do. All right, so most people are scared to, scared to death to give a presentation. So here's my first speech again at Standard & Poor's. So, in anticipation of you know a bunch of kids who really hadn't done presentations before, Standard & Poor's says, we're going to give you some training. And they did a couple of things. One of the things they did is they gave us speech training, which they had a professional presenter come in, and it was like three days. And by the way, if you really want to do a presentation skills class, it's three days. It's not two hours. But you know, we'll do the best that we can do in the time that we have, right? But what she did is, um, and it was relatively small groups. Maybe there were about 10 or 12. And everybody got a chance to take, to do like a one minute presentation in front of a tape. So what you would do is you would, you talk about anything, it really didn't matter. So, you know, for one minute you'd stand up in front of the camera and you would do your presentation. And then, and this is old, so they would give you a, like a, a VHS tape, which of course probably doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and then you'd get critique from each of the people in the room. And then you would give the tape, give them the tape to go to a different room and watch it. See how you appear to yourself. And as I mentioned before, you always think you did worse than you did. You put the tape in, and it was like, that's not terrible. Second time was like a two-minute presentation. Third time was about a five-minute presentation. But the time you finished, you had that confidence that I, I could do this. I mean, only five minutes. But um, you get better each time you do it. It's like I said, nobody's born a great presenter, but it's learned. So the more you do, the better you are. Um, I had suggested something like that here. But again, we just didn't have the time. so. Uh, what the IABA said is just um, you know, throw out as much information as you can. And I know it's hard because I'm dumping a lot of stuff on you. Take what you think is important um, and then uh, you know, use what you think you need. All right. Um, like I said, for most people, presentation skills don't come naturally. You know, some will eventually be really, really good. You know, others won't. You know, people are, you know, everybody's a little bit different. And you can, uh, you know, have somebody give 100 speeches and still be, you know, horribly boring. Um, others, after the third one, you can just, you just want to hear more of them. Uh, you want to be the latter. Um, everybody's going to have a different style. Somebody, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're serious. You want to be credible. Uh, not everybody is comfortable telling jokes, but we're going to talk a little bit about telling jokes. Because oftentimes, when you start a presentation and you're funny, people start paying attention to you. If you, um, what do they tell you at Toastmasters? Well, yeah, they, they tell, they tell us mainly to, well, relax and and they, they don't really s say like tell jokes even even though that's mm -hmm. good. We and we do have a a section in each meeting where somebody comes up and tells a joke okay. to kind of lighten the mood like before the pe people give their speeches. So that's yeah, but it's the same thing. Sometimes the joke will relax you. Right. You know, you're, you're, you're waiting for this guy to stand up or this person to stand up and be kind of boring, and all of a sudden he tells a joke and everybody laughs and they're relaxed, and that's really all it's about. Um, Sometimes I'll tell a joke. Sometimes I'll comment on somebody's uh, previous presentation. But yeah, it's all about relaxing them and to pay attention to me. Um, and as an advertisement for Toastmasters, it's a really, really good organization. So um, if you're uh, you know, thinking about, you know, if you're going to be in a position to give many, many presentations, and you all will, uh, it's a good organization to get to know. You actually may get to the point where you enjoy making presentations. I enjoy making presentations. Uh, I'm still nervous, 
but you know, I kind of get psyched because you know, I get to, it's like acting, I guess. It's like I own, I own the stage, I own the podium. You have to talk, you have to listen to me. You're a captive audience. Um, but uh, it, it, it gets to be kind of fun. Uh, and the more you do, I think the more fun it'll be. First couple of times, not so much, but it gets better. You all ever listen to a bad speech? I've, I've listened to lots and lots of bad speeches. Um, listen to a lot of great ones. Um, here, there, is, uh, there are ways to, so here's a quiet talker. They're hard to hear. It's hard to get excited. The person speaking is really just mumbling about <laughs> But a lot of people do that, and they don't realize that they're doing it. Um, you know, they're trying to, to do their best, but they, they kind of, you know, go back into bad habits, and they're very quiet. And I'm sorry, but quiet is boring. It's hard to get excited when you can't hear the person speak, or if you, you know, it's just, it's just hard. Um, it's difficult to understand. It's just not exciting. But people do it, and you'll hear it. Monotone presentations. I'd like to talk to you today <laughs> about giving a presentation <laughs> in the most exciting way possible. A lot of people do this, too. They don't change their voice. Um, there's no excitement in their voice, so how are you going to get excited listening to them, right? Um, but a lot of people do it. They don't realize they're doing it again. Um, but it's just practice will get you out of the habit, but a lot of people will do it. We talked a little bit before about reading. Um, if I read to you, it's boring. Um, so there's a pro. If, if you're really nervous and you want to read, you're not going to forget what you have to say, right? So it's, you're going to follow it. You're not going to miss anything. It's not really exciting if I'm reading to you. It's like I'm in third grade and I'm reading a story at nap time. <laughs> um, but for the people who just start making presentations, it's, it's a, sort of an easy way just to stay on task. The last thing you want to do is to be sort of halfway through the presentation and say, oh, gee, I forgot that big part. You're not going to forget it if you read it, which is not going to be exciting either. So here's a con. It's a rookie mistake. Uh, people who just begin making presentations uh, will read comes across less credible. Gives the impression that the speaker doesn't know the material well. Why is he reading? Maybe he doesn't know the material well. Uh, you want to present a confident, you know, kind of an expertise up there. Can't do it if you have to refer to your notes. What are they telling you Toastmasters about that? Uh, yeah, they, they do. They do tell us about that, and, and not to read. Just actually made that mis made that mistake when I first started. Everybody does. Right. Everybody does. And, and it's it's not necessarily a bad mistake to make in the beginning, but it's a mistake you can grow out of. Uh, and again, it takes away from your perceived credibility. Exactly the same way. Why is he reading? Why does he have to refer to his notes? Well, um, he may be new to this. Um, in which case, maybe he's not terribly credible. Too technical. So I went to an actuarial conference the other day. Really did. Um, um, say it wasn't so much actuarial, but it was um, it was quantitative finance. Um, when Dr. Grace uh, introduced the uh, the department, uh, he had mentioned uh, Professional Risk Managers International Association. Premier, there's 86,000 members, and most of them are quantitative finance. So a lot of you all will kind of fit in there. I don't fit in there. That's not my background. But um, I was the person at Georgia State who worked to get the accreditation. Um, we're working on a couple of projects with them. I figured it was a good place to be seen. Uh, I would be noticed by my absence if I didn't go there. So I went there. I was in New York City. I'm from New York, and I love New York. So I sit in this conference, and the presenter is, you ever see those incredible formulas that a PhD? So I, I don't know those things. I don't care to know those things. I don't know if I can understand those things. But here they were dissecting these things, and I'm thinking, oh my god. <laughs> I've got a half an hour to be um, polite um, and, and try to pretend like I'm awake listening to one of those things. It was too technical for me. And it was probably my fault because I sat into a, a presentation that was really not for me. Um, now the guy was pretty bored. Um, he just, he was a scientist and he just kind of went right through the numbers and if you didn't happen to have you know, your PhD, it was really hard to follow. So maybe not anticipating there would be some less technical people like me, um, and maybe he didn't care. But he was just so ultra technical that he lost me. He probably lost a lot of other people in the room as well. Um, now, you live in a very, or you will live in a very high tech world. Um, so this is where you sort of need to know your audience. Um, you know, if your audience is a bunch of other actuaries, they're going to get it. They're going to get the technical stuff. They're going to understand what you're talking about. If your audience is a little bit less technical, you know. So I have an MBA, I don't have a PhD. 
um, if you're talking to a bunch of MBAs, um, you may have to, dumb it down is not the right word, but bring it down a little bit. So then you, you talk to their level of understanding. You know, I taught a, a freshman learning community class and I taught a very, very complicated subject. We needed to make sure everybody understood it before we took it to advance. Um, this person at this conference, he just made the assumption that everybody knew what he did and I was lost. So, I won't do that. Alright, um, and then boring. Um, boring is boring. It's, so what is boring? It's, if anything, that doesn't really, you know, get you, but you, you've listened to boring before. Don't be boring. <laughs> Alright, ever listen to a great speaker? Uh, great speakers are great. You can just listen to them all the time. You don't really care what they have to say, but they have a way about them. That is just really interesting. So good speaker is like a great book, engage you from the beginning. It's like you're sitting around and somebody starts their presentation. He's a great speaker. It's like, I'm going to pay attention. Um, and it could be hours, maybe not, but um, let's go back. But uh, they, can, they can talk for a long time and they just, they just engage you. They command your attention, even if it's a subject of little interest. Um, so when I start a presentation, you know, there was a presentation I gave, I guess it was two years ago. Um, maybe it was 60 people, maybe it was 70 people. It was sort of a mid-sized presentation. And you can see people just, you know, chit-chatting to, you know, their neighbors. And you get up and you raise your voice a little bit, and it's like they pay attention. They just sit up and they say, oh, okay. Uh, commands respect, or at least commands attention. Um, and then as you go through the presentation, you try to be as credible as you can, and they just they just look at you. They don't fiddle with their uh, you know uh, their phones, and they don't do things that uh, are distracting. Um, they pay attention to you, so that's what you want. And, and sometimes it's a joke, and sometimes it's just raising your voice, and it could be a lot of things. Uh, it could be just saying something that's interesting. Uh, but you want them to stop what they're doing, focus on you. Um, Main focus for the duration of your presentation. Confidence. If you listen to somebody who's a great speaker, they just exude confidence. You know that that person knows what he's talking about. Um, and you want to pay attention to him because, you know, he or she is, is they're, they're the one. You believe what they're saying and you want to hear more. You know, 15 minutes is too short, 30 minutes is too short. You want to hear more because this is a really good speaker. Um, you look at the audience, every once in a while you'll do, see a presentation and um, I can't really feel like I'm engaging you if I'm not even looking at you. So I look at you. It's kind of creepy if I just stare at you <laughs> so you don't do that. And, and one of the ways to sort of do this is you look to the back of the room. So I'm looking for Michelle, to Michelle. Um, to the rest of you, it looks like I'm looking at you, but I'm looking either at a clock or I'm looking at something there but my gaze is here, I'm not looking at my feet. I'm trying to engage each one of you, you know, without you know, staring and being you know, that. Um, but it personalizes the presentation because it looks like I'm talking to you rather than speaking at you. Um, and it helps. Know your material can't do a credible presentation if you don't know what you're talking about. Because the audience will pick it up. Uh, you know, some of those who don't know as much as you do may say, well, maybe he knows what he's talking about. But there'll be a lot of really smart people in that audience, and they're going to say, mm, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Um, and, and they'll probably be right. And again, talks to you rather than reach to you. It's just easier to listen to somebody talking. Here's something that I learned from, I think, one of my first bosses at S&P. So I used to um, you know, go with that person to meetings. And the way he would make a presentation changed based upon who he was talking to. He could basically size up the client in just a couple minutes. Does the client want to, uh, does he already know what I know and he just wants to ask questions? Does he not know anything, in which case I have to feed it to him? Uh, is he sort of a personal guy, in which case I want to be joking with him? Is he a serious guy, in which case I don't want to joke with him? But everybody's a little bit different, and everybody responds to, to different things. Um, I think I probably did one of my best presentations to uh, one of the chief financial officer at Volkswagen. I had five minutes. 
um, every other presentation before ran long, I had five minutes left and I had to do an hour's worth of material in five minutes. I did. Um, and it was like I had to think of what does he want? You know, he just he just wanted boom, 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 what he needs. Uh, and I was able to, you know, boil down my presentation to say, look, this is what you need to know. Let's flip to page 17 because the rest of it is just not important. And he got it. Um, it was an amazing presentation. Uh, they're not always amazing, but if you can size up the person you're talking to and get a sense for, you know, what it's going to take for him to kind of connect with you, uh, that's what you need to do. And that's both in a personal meeting and that's also in a, in a conference. Um, <coughs> Because if you can look into somebody's eyes and they're kind of glazed over and they're not getting it, you need to find a different way of explaining it. Um, because if they continue not to get it, they're going to turn you off, they're going to believe that you're boring, and it's just going to be a waste of your time. But if I look at somebody's eyes and I'm thinking, hmm, you didn't really get that, did you? Um, let me find a different way of explaining it. Um, maybe a better way. And if I can't find, a, if the second way doesn't work, I'll try a third. Um, because I believe that. I can get it across if, if I try it a, a different way. Works as a teacher too. Um, and sometimes you use humor. Depends on the situation. All right, so for the Americans here, uh, the, our, the national conventions are coming up. Uh, lots and lots of speeches, some amazing speeches. I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or whatever, but some of these speeches are just unbelievable. Um, you know, our president, what a great orator. I listen to him forever. Um, but there are others that'll get up and they'll just bore you to tears. Um, Obama's a great, uh, a great speaker. He can just, uh, you know, just listen to him for hours. Um, he's, uh, he's very skilled. All right, so speeches, speeches, speeches. Some will be great. Um, every two, every three, really good. Generally, what the uh, conventions do is they take their best speakers and they put them up last. Um, you know, not that many people or fewer people will watch it until you get to the point where we're actually going to, uh, you know, elect a, a candidate. But once they do, um, they generally have a, uh, you know, one of their best uh, speech makers come up and you know, say great things about their candidate. Uh, oftentimes, it's a two or three hour speech. Um, but really good stuff. All right, so question. Suppose your boss asks you to represent your company at a conference and be part of a panel discussion. Familiar with panel discussions? <coughs> you can see one tomorrow. So it's basically three or four people sit down and they have a topic to go through and then each take their turn and kind of go through it. Um, it's sort of the more of the norm of what you'll see in conferences. So you're not necessarily going to see, well, a couple of times you're going to see somebody stand up in front of an entire room, um, and those are generally pretty senior people. But mostly you get to choose your topic. So you know you go into an actuarial conference, and I don't know, uh, life reinsurance actuary is what you want to be, and there's a uh, panel on it. And normally what you'll see is three or four people from three or four different organizations, um, and it's a it's a little bit of a you know I'll tell you what I think you want to know, but it's a lot of Q and A. So it's highly likely that in the next several years you'll be on those panels. Um, so what do you do? The interesting thing is um, it kind of makes you think on the fly a little bit um, because you don't necessarily know what the other guy is going to say or how long the other person is going to take or the questions that you're going to get or the direction of the panel. So um, first of all, who's your audience? So. So I made the mistake, as I mentioned, in that uh, in the premier conference of going to one that was too technical for me. Um, so the panelists probably thought that everybody was, uh, you know, a PhD and uh, you know, in mathematical finance, and, and and they could, you know, crank out formulas and, and be okay. Uh, they would be wrong, um, or, or at least I was. But figuring out who your audience is: are they junior people? Are they senior people? Are they uh, biz are they uh, sales people? Are they analysts? It really makes a difference about what you want to say figuring out who your audience is. Um, like I said, if you're preparing a presentation for somebody who knows as much as you do, be as technical as you want. Um, if you're talking to somebody who uh, may not know as much, because maybe the, uh, maybe the, uh, the material is brand new, um, then you want to you wanna bring it down a little bit. You also want to call your panelists. Uh, 
last thing you want to do is to say, well, I want to talk about this, and have the person next to you talk about the same thing that you're going to talk to. And then what do you talk about? Um, I've seen that happen. It's all about organization. Um, what is your topic? How long is your presentation? Mm -hmm. Panelists talk for about 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. You generally don't have a whole lot of time, so uh, you know, the little time that you have is you know, parsing together some, some interesting information, um, but leaving more for Q&A. And again, speak to your audience. You know, don't speak at them. Um, as we have, trying to repeat myself a little bit, but this is important stuff. Look into their eyes because they'll tell you if they get it. If that person at the premier conference would have looked at my eyes, uh, I wouldn't have been sleeping, um, but he would have seen that uh, you know, Mr. Wood there, he just doesn't get it. He's bored. And again, you can slow down, speed up, you can, you can change your level of understanding. I think I would have gotten that material um, had the presenter just said, hmm, uh, maybe I don't want to be quite so technical. Um, maybe I should explain a little bit more about you know, how this all works uh, before I start you know, throwing formulas on the floor. Um, in which case, I think I would have gotten a lot more out of the conference. But this wasn't the case. So here's your 101 version, basically dumbing it down. Two slides. All right, so let me ask a couple of questions here. So you just landed your job as a life actuary. Your uncle is an insurance broker for Aon. He knows insurance pretty well. How would you explain what you're doing in your new job? So let me throw it, throw it out. You just got a job as an actuary. I'm your uncle. I'm a, uh, I'm a vice president of Aon. Um, I want to know what you're doing. So who wants to explain to Uncle Barry <laughs> who works at Aon, uh, what a life actuary does. Sure. Um, I guess I'll just give like a little brief summary Pretend of... Pretend I'm your uncle. Hi, Uncle Barry. Hi, Uncle Barry. You have an understanding of how of the benefits of the various insurance products that Aon offers. However, I work more along behind the scenes, as in how do you determine what price your members would pay for their insurance? It's all based on mortality, it's all based on mortality, mortality tables, as in how long you expect the individual to live and other different factors, but I helped to compute that person's premium by taking into account all of those factors. Okay, that's really good. I got that. Your Uncle Barry would get that. <laughs> now what if I were a carpenter? I don't have an insurance background. Uh, explain to me your new job. <laughs> Anybody want to take a crack at it? Maybe I'm just going to explain it just in, uh, in the layman's terms. Hi, Uncle Barry. Okay, I'm a busy carpenter. I'm a carpenter, so again, not an insurance background. I may not understand okay. that explanation. Yeah. What I do at uh, uh, my job is to determine the price that anybody wants to get in life insurance based on the person's maybe current condition or based on a set of factors that have been established. How much the person is going to pay marketing or annually, something like that. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, a little bit less technical. Okay. You know, something without somebody who doesn't have an insurance background would be able to get that explanation more than would have gotten your explanation. Your explanation was perfect for somebody who's a professional in insurance. Yours for somebody who's, uh, who's not. Uh, and, and it's the same thing when you're looking at somebody's eyes when you're doing a presentation. Uh, you don't know whether he's a carpenter or whether he's a VP at Aon. So their eyes will tell you. I'm a carpenter. <laughs> yeah, again, this is scanning the audience. Um, look at the clock in the back. I mean, there isn't a clock, there's a Michelle in the back. But um, like I said, uh, you, you look in the back, look over everybody's head, everybody thinks they're looking at you. Peace. 
here's this is a good one. So there's always some smart aleck, several actually, that think that they're smarter than the presenter. Maybe they are. Um, but they always want to trip them up with this really tough question that uh, makes the presenter look like a look like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, so they're they're hard to they're hard to defend because you know sometimes you know you get the hand up and says you know, Mr. Presenter, and then and they kind of launch into their um, and again not a lot to defend on that. Just see if you can it's more of a deflect than uh, tend to answer and fall into their trap. So when you're doing a presentation, you've probably heard this before. You know, say what you're going to say, say it, say it again. Is that familiar to everybody? Okay, well, let me explain it for those who aren't. So if I was going to do a presentation, it's, so I want to talk to you about um, Notre Dame football. Say what you're going to say. And then I would say, blah, 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 about Notre Dame football. I'd say it. And in conclusion, I wanted to say, um, it's a good way to set up a speech. It really is. It, it re-emphasizes it uh, to, uh, to everybody in the audience. Um, there's no doubt about what you're going to say. Um, normally, if you say it a couple of times, uh, it's more likely to take hold. People are more likely to remember it. Um, and it kind of keeps you on path and makes for a good presentation. So uh, in, in, in life, in school, in weddings, or anything else, just follow that. It's a, it's a good way to go. Here are a couple of things as well. Um, here's a couple of reasons why I don't write out my speech. I generally do bullet points, because I know what I want to say, and I kind of know the order in which I want to say it. But if you write it, you're going to be tempted to memorize it. Well, I'm not really great at memorizing it. So if I'm memorizing a 15-minute speech, uh, chances are I'm going to forget bits and pieces. And the last thing you want to do is when you're you know, halfway through a speech just to say, I think I, think I forgot that. And where am I? Um, so, again, reasons not to write. Um, if, you sent, if you're memorizing it and you're committing it to memory and you're trying to go through it word by word, it's going to sound like you're reading. And if you read it, it's going to take away from you know being exciting and something less than boring. So, bullet points, bullet points, bullet points. And practice, practice, practice. We talked a little bit before that, but so. So how much practice is too much practice? There is actually a point where it's too much practice. Um, if you continue to make your, uh, you know, practice until it sounds like you've got to commit it to memory, you've practiced too much. Um, I think you want to get to the point where each time you go through it, it's a little bit different. Um, not too much different as to lose the point, but enough different to be, to be interesting. So we started talking a little bit before about you know, starting with a joke. Well, I've got a couple. Um, <clears throat> was that uh, uh, that that same uh, Societe Generale conference um, you know, several years ago in France? And this senior guy, and, and, and again, you had to appreciate who was in the audience. So there were Europeans, there were Americans, there were Asians. Well, let me just say that there were a number of Chinese people there. Um, wouldn't you know it? This uh, senior executive tells a racial joke. So, and what a toad. Um, I don't know if he realized that it was insulting to five or six people in the audience, but there's a part, a point where it's inappropriate. Um, and everybody should know what's appropriate and inappropriate, but sometimes you get to that gray area and you're just not sure. Uh, so, I'll, so, there was one presentation at that standard and uh, This is a lawyer, you know, basically making fun of himself. So he says, what's the difference between a dead dog lying in the middle of the road and a dead lawyer lying in the middle of the road? Well, there are skid marks in front of the dog. <laughs> so everybody laughs, and that was really good. Uh, this one's a little bit more in the gray area, but it's probably OK. And I'll use this analogy, because there are a bunch of future actuaries in the, in, in the room. So a dentist and an actuary um, go to the men's room, go to the bathroom. And uh, as they're finishing up, the actuary finishes at the, at the urinal, heads to the door, at which the dentist says, <clears throat> uh, we dentists were taught that we wash our hands after we go to the bathroom. <laughs> to which the actuary comes back and says, well, we actuaries are taught not to pee in our hands. <laughs> <laughs> now, feel free to change that to Auburn University, Georgia State, to just anything. It is just 
it's it's not inappropriate. It's starting to get there, um, but you can get away with that. But it's but it's a cute little anecdote, and sometimes you can follow it up if uh, you know if some I don't know some <coughs> dentist says something stupid to you or, or says something you know mildly insulting at a in a conference. You can come back and, and, and use that or so. But everybody's relaxed now because they heard something that's that's kind of funny, um, and now they're going to pay attention. So I like starting off with jokes, um, as long as they're funny and as long as they're not inappropriate. Um, and it should only be like one or two because at the end of the day, this isn't a stand-up routine. It was one of it was one prep you for something more important, uh, and that's it. Oftentimes, I'll start with a clever comment on the previous presenter's talk. So think about think about panel discussions, if you will. So there are five people lined up, and everybody has comments. Um, and so I keep saying, well, it's probably not the right time to say a joke at this point, because I'm like the fourth person up or the fifth person up. And maybe there's another way to relax the audience. So I can take what the previous person said and kind of create a, an interesting, if not humorous, anecdote. Um, and again, it relaxes people. It kind of sets the stage for well, what I want to talk about for the next five minutes. You want to get the crowd on your side quickly. And that's where the laughter helps a little bit. Especially if you're in a panel discussion and you're 15 minutes into something that's relatively boring. You say, well, how do I, how do I get the, the people to kind of pay attention to me? Because they weren't paying attention to these people before. Um, so you know, any attempt at humor, uh, any attempt at being interesting, uh, changes the mood, brings them to your side. And if all you're asking them to do is pay attention to you for 10 minutes, you got them. You got them. Strong, confident voice grabs their attention. Visual aids. This isn't the best presentation, right? Uh, as far as you know, there are no pictures here. Um, some of the best visual presentations can be a little bit funny, but um, pay careful attention to your uh, to your PowerPoint. My kids and my kids are 22 and 19. Um, they can, they can take PowerPoint slides and make them really interesting. I imagine everybody in this room could do something that's more interesting than just putting words on a piece of paper here. Um, but it grabs people's attention. It kind of holds them for a little bit. Um, and it's part, of the, it's part of the holding them. Tell stories. I like to tell stories. I have a lot of stories in my life. I'm 53, so I've got a couple of stories. But, you know, so I've told you a couple today, but if you make your point telling stories, the program, the presentation, is a whole lot more interesting than just going through a series of facts. What do they tell you at Toastmaster? Oh, what do they tell me about telling stories? Yeah. Oh, well, j just to be sure that you are interesting. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. That just be sure that you uh, capture the interest of the and Telling stories makes it interesting. Right. It kind of relates a world, real world life experience to what you're talking about. Um, and it's usually, hopefully, interesting. Like I said before, own the podium. This is my podium. So you're listening to me for, gee, a long time. But um, you know, it's it, it could be fun to stand up here and kind of you know, have a captive audience for a while. I guess if they said a good actor, speaker, can read a phone book and sound interesting. Now I would don't think that's awfully interesting to stand up and read a phone book. But there are certain people who are great presenters who can actually do that, and you pay attention to them for some period of time. And it's, uh, it's a little bit like Goldilocks, you know, it's not too hot, not too cold, just right, but not too fast, not too slow, just right. And there's a pace that kind of fits with people. Um, you've heard fast talkers, you've heard slow talkers. But just right and then modulating your voice will make a, you know, a, a mediocre presentation more interesting and a good presentation really, really good. Again, same for volume. Pause for a second. People sort of pay attention when you kind of stop and wait for everybody to catch up a little bit. You don't want to do it too often. You sound like a, a dope, right? But, but very obviously, it's okay. Here's something, and uh, the, uh, the, the teen teachers for Excel are going to have sort of a double whammy with you all at 1 o'clock. One after lunch, people are a little bit tired. Uh, early morning, sometimes people are tired. Um, Excel um, can make people really tired real quick. 
After lunch, you want to wake people up. Um, a lot of ways you can do that. Um, but you know, walk around, be a little visually interesting, raise your volume, talk to them before you get serious. Uh, really hard to engage an audience at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and after they've had a burger. <laughs> So what do you do with your body language? So I'll tell you what I was told. I'm not curious what Toastmasters say. Um, if you're at a podium, sometimes they'll say, it's OK to do this. Sometimes you can walk around with your hands in your pockets. Um, I guess the jury is still out on how much my wife's Italian. And uh, uh, Italians oftentimes talk with their hands. Um, they make points. Um, I think it's very, very effective. Um, and I kind of like to see it periodically with presenters, too, because the last thing you want to do is to stay straight and stare. But if you walk around, it makes a little bit more of an interesting presentation. So um, I try to do that and hope for the best. Posture. I was told I have good posture. I don't know if I have good posture. I, uh, one, of, one of the guys that works with me, I have given a presentation to, uh, um, it, it's basically trying to educate some of our students about you know the things that we have in our department so I, I, I give presentations to our uh, business law class because everybody has to take business law and not everybody knows about risk management and insurance so I go through like 10 classes every semester um, you know this is what we do and this is why it's interesting blah 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 um, so John who's uh, he's got a similar position to me he said Barry I had some feedback they said you got really good posture I said that's code for hot <laughs> Exactly true, but it made me laugh. What are you doing here? Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do, because we have a lot of time <coughs> left, but a little bit of time left, um, I want to give you about four or five minutes, and I want each one of you to come up about thirty seconds, just thirty seconds, and I don't care what you want to talk about, but I want you to talk about something why you want to be an actuary, you know, why you went to the school you went to, uh, what made you interested in this boot camp, what's your favorite football team, you know, what do you like to listen to, don't really care. But I want everybody to come up for 30 seconds, just 30 seconds, um, and, and, and make a really, really quick presentation. So why don't, since it's only a 30 second presentation, why don't we give you till about uh, quarter after, 24 people, that's about right. Um, See what you come up with. Make it in.